it was so alarming to read this. Explain to people what it actually means to break a planetary boundary. Well, fortunately, the world isn't going to go under because we've broken planetary bounds. They're rather more like your, like your blood pressure. If your blood pressure is over 120, over 80, it's no guarantee you're going to have a heart attack, but it does increase the risk. And that's what the planetary boundaries framework does. We are impacting the planet at the global level, so we need to manage our relationship with the global environment. And to do that, we have to know how much is too much. Politicians focus on climate, but there are many other things that we're impacting at the global level. So what we try to do is using the most up-to-date science, try and argue when is the pressure we're putting on these planetary boundaries too great. So where are we, do you think, on that trajectory? Well, for six of them, we're on the wrong side of the boundary. But as I say, that in itself is not a problem in that in the 1990s, we were crossed or very close to crossing the ozone boundary. But now we're back in a safe operating space. So the fact that we're on the wrong side for six is worrying. But what's more worrying is that we're even farther on the wrong side for four of them than we were in 2015, the last time we looked at it. And that means our pressure on the global environment is increasing as you and I are speaking. As you pointed out, climate change is much discussed. And I want to talk to you about that in a minute, just at the United Nations. What other factors are coming into play to put us outside this safe operating space? Well, the most important is biodiversity. We forget the fact that we get so focused on climate. We forget the fact it's not climate that makes this planet unique. Every planet has a climate. What makes this planet unique is that there's life, biodiversity, and it's the interaction between climate and biodiversity that create the conditions on Earth. So biodiversity is the most important of the other boundaries. But many of the things we do, felling forests, removing water, putting out synthetic human-made chemicals to the environment, all are impacting either biodiversity or climate or both. So how do we correct this imbalance? Well, we correct this imbalance by focusing on the fact that it's our it's our waste products. Six of the nine planetary boundaries are about the waste we're putting into the environment. For example, greenhouse gas waste. Nature doesn't produce waste. We shouldn't be doing waste either. So, so we need to be working towards a circular economy. The other three have to do with how much we're taking out of the environment. And it's the environment, it's the Earth's resources that are our actual currency. Nobody can eat money to get to stay to to, to get full. So, so it's the Earth's resources that are our real yeah, currency, if you will. And so we have to think of cost effectiveness, that is to say, not using more of our resources than absolutely necessary to meet our needs. We do it with money. We should be able to do it with resources as well. Yeah, interesting. I'm so pleased you mentioned about the ozone layer. And I think back to that period where there was so much discussion, but then there was a decision made to target it. And as you say, we're, we're back on that right side. We've just seen the UN Climate Summit come and gone with emissions targets not met. Um, the big emitters not even invited to talk because they are not serious about meeting these targets. You know, th these are concerning issues that it seems globally we're not taking this seriously. I think we are taking it seriously, but we have to we have to remember that this is this is high politics. This is, has to do with with powers, power struggles between countries. Right now, we know that we've filled at least or actually slightly more than the garbage dump that we can allow ourselves to fill with greenhouse gases. We know exactly who filled that garbage dump. And the whole discussion is about who should have the rights to use the last half of it. Those of us who have made infrastructure dependent on it think we should still be able to use it. And those of the, the countries that haven't had the opportunity yet really don't understand why some of us should be able to use it and they can't. So this is about ethics, this is about sharing. And we all know from, from our interactions with other people, that's not easy. But at the end of the day, we have to figure this out. And I honestly believe that we will, but it really 
requires considerably more focus than it has today. It's so true. And, you know, it's you can see that the, the shift to these greener technologies is in sight. There are lots of countries globally adapting. But in a way, we can't go as quick as we would like to without potentially, you know, causing stresses and strains elsewhere. Well, here's the trick in this. We don't know how fast we have to go. We know we're going more slowly than we wanted to go, but we also know that the warmer it gets and the more greenhouse gas we put out or the more we impact biodiversity, the greater the risk is that our own activities will change conditions on Earth in such a way that they will no longer be able to support the modern civilizations that we all, all believe are our right. So we're running a huge risk here. And I honestly don't believe that humanity would be so dumb as to ignore the knowledge that we have because knowledge is power. We know how to fix this. We just have to do it.